I took a lot of things in my life for granted. <laughs> like we all do. Too busy staring at our phones or at our feet to look up and wonder. Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny. Fairy tales for children with no real consequences on our everyday lives. We stop believing in magic younger and younger these days until we find the one person who makes us see the magic in everything. That was me. It was all I really ever wanted and needed. Now at the end of the line, I know for a fact that true magic exists. If that's what you'd wish to call it, anyway. Things unexplainable by science or reason. But what you wouldn't expect is that beyond the whimsy and curiosity, there's really no design to it. It's not benevolent. Not malicious. It just is. And it's as random, chaotic, and unforgiving as anything else in this universe. My name is Theodore, Theo, for short, but to my beautiful bride, Angela, it was Teddy. It was a nickname I had always hated from memories of schoolyard bullies in third grade, and it irritated me even to hear it spoken in her sweet voice. I guess you could say that it was our first fight as a couple, but it wasn't a real fight. I just told her I didn't like it, and she got all huffy and pouty in that cute way that she often did. Well... I preferred her smile, so I bought her a dozen roses and a little teddy bear to make up and told her that I'd always be her teddy. She liked that. She gave the teddy bear an honorable place in her purse, peeking out at the world from atop her cell phone and who knows how many long-lost movie ticket stubs from bygone date nights. She cherished it because she cherished me. And that's exactly where it sat. And the night it all came to such an abrupt end. It was the evening of Thanksgiving 2002, barely a month after our wedding day. We were on our way to our parents' house for dinner. It happened in a blur, and it was over faster than I could react. An SUV coming towards us hit a patch of black ice driving well over the speed limit. A glittering shower of broken glass and dull crunches of fiberglass and metal. In it. Darkness. The next thing I knew, I was looking up at Angela's bloodied and glass-studded legs from the passenger side floorboard. I didn't know how I managed to fall there, but I immediately feared paralysis. I couldn't move my head to see past her knees. I couldn't speak to tell her that it would be alright. I could only watch her tremble and listen to her moans of confusion and agony. Still, we were alive. And I was grateful for that. Even more so, I heard the sirens approaching and saw the first few flashes of red and blue lights. She started sobbing violently, the worst sound in the world to my ears, and I can only hope it was at least partially from relief. It took the first responders a solid 20 minutes to free her from the twisted remains of our 94 Honda Civic with the jaws of life and ease her into a gurney. All the while... They seemed to pay me no mind, at least not until she reached out for me with her left hand and begged for their help. Please. Teddy. And as the nearest paramedic reached for me, my confusion and terror reached new heights. I was whisked away with a single guided hand, turning helplessly in her anxious grip as the paramedic placed me in her arms. No, no, Teddy! Teddy! I've never heard her scream like that, and all at once I understood why. As they wheeled the gurney away for a brief moment, I bore witness to a terrifying spectacle through my new eyes. I saw myself, lifeless and mangled, crushed between the SUV's fender and what was left of the driver's seat. Just a limp right arm and the right half of my face staring back at me with one unblinking bloodshot eye. They misunderstood her. And even in death, it seemed, I would remain her teddy.
Angela had passed out during the ambulance ride to the hospital and wouldn't regain consciousness again for hours after the first series of tests. I remained inexplicably conscious the entire time, a disembodied mind somehow shackled to a stuffed toy I bought at a drugstore. Having just witnessed my own death, I wasn't interested in pondering a rational explanation for something I could barely accept. I would never understand. There was only one question that mattered to me anymore. Why? Why am I here when that accident should have taken my life? Why can I see her in pain with eyes that shouldn't see? Why can I hear her cry with ears that shouldn't hear? Why do I feel the panic tension in her grip and smell the fading scent of her perfume when these senses should have died with me? Why me? Because for something so irrational, so impossible, there has to be a reason. There had to be something that I was meant to see, something important enough that I could not pass from this world until I did. I toiled away the hours in thought, tucked away with the rest of her belongings until they finally wheeled her into her room. When she regained consciousness, I was the first thing she asked for. Me, her teddy, the last vestige of a promise that I had failed to keep. Of the real me, there was nothing left to say. She had seen what I had seen, and she already knew. I was gone, and I would be her teddy no more. The stuffed bear was all that was left. She held me tighter with every second, as if she might keep my heart and her memories of me from falling away. And though she'd never know it, somehow, she had done just that. It was some sort of spinal injury, the doctor explained, but I was never good with medical jargon. What I did understand was that it would be a few grueling months of treatment and therapy before she could walk again, and even then, she'd never quite be the same. Still, my brave girl never stopped fighting. Through the sweat and tears, she took it day by day, and she never stopped talking to me. Each night, she promised me she wouldn't give up. She promised me that she would live her life because she knew it's what I would want. I hoped that she knew just how proud of her I was. I believe that she did, as close as she kept me, but while I was glad that having me near helped her recover, there was still times when I... Um, it wasn't enough. Times when I wish that I'd still had arms to hold her, to comfort her, to protect her. From her earliest, weakest moments in that hospital bed, I had reason to fear for her safety in my absence. In that state without me at her side, anything could happen. I'd be powerless to stop it. For the first two weeks of her recovery, the object of that fear was a man named Jacob, the physical therapist who could not be bothered to respect the boundaries of a grieving widow. He often called her precious and princess, but after having survived a near-death experience and losing me in the process, she wasn't exactly in the frame of mind to tolerate the advances of a new man, let alone his endearing pet names. It made her uncomfortable. It turned his healing touch into something invasive, unwelcome. And when she demanded for him to stop, it only made things worse. Therapeutic massages became unprofessionally sensual. Agonizing strength and balance exercises invited unwanted lustful gazes. Every waking moment filled with his nauseating brand of encouragement and his confessions of longing. For those first two weeks, she endured it all in silence, for fear that he, well, he might hurt her if provoked. And against my will, I did the same, pressing to her cheek and dampening her tears every night. It wasn't until he crossed a very personal line that she mustered the strength to resist him. As he massaged her left thigh to her lasting discomfort one unpleasant Tuesday morning, she noticed a familiar shimmer on his right ring finger, a simple white gold band with a diagonal three diamond inlay and I could hear a tremor of rage in her voice as she noticed it missing from the chain around her neck. Is that my husband's wedding band? He could have only stolen it when the painkillers let her sleep more soundly than usual. Yeah. What do you think? He smugly admitted. Does it look better on me? Lucky coincidence that we wore the same size. And he had the audacity to laugh. 
She slapped him across the face harder than I would have thought she could, twice, just to punctuate her outrage, and then wrestled the ring from his finger. I want you out of here. Now. That's my girl, I thought. There was the fight I knew that she had inside of her. Through my indignation, I just smiled inside as she hammered the help button next to her bed. That was the last that the hospital saw of Jacob, but I'd never forgot the fury in his eyes as they escorted him away. From that day forward, she made real progress. Without that creepy bastard making her fear for her safety, and with my memory in her heart, she improved by leaps and bounds. She was up and around in two months and out of the hospital for good and three. But those first few days back on her feet did not make for a happy occasion. My family put off the funeral until she was well enough to attend. They loved her as much as I did, and they knew it'd be important for her to grieve properly before she could move on, and as always, I came along for the ride. This time in her lap instead of her purse, while she clutched me as tight as she had that first night in her hospital bed. But they say funerals are for the living, and that's true. I didn't understand why until I heard old friends, people I had lost contact with years ago, speaking fondly about me like it was only yesterday. A few friends' anecdotes even elicited some warm chuckles here and there. It wasn't about who I was on the day that I died, but how they remembered me. In the years and decades before. And it was difficult to process. It was surreal. Listening to my loved ones talk to me in the past tense and, and watching them lower my casket into the grave. The finality of it all escaped me even as I sat among them hearing every word I was never meant to hear. If not for her heart-wrenching sobs directly above me. It would have seemed like a twisted joke. While it seemed to last forever, the sun eventually set and tomorrow would be a new day. Angela, my angel. She never let me go. But with each passing day, the pain of loss faded a little more. She returned to work at the bowling alley where I first met her. And I returned with her, spending my days in a little employee locker in the back room, waiting in the dark to see her face again. But the wait was always worth it. It was reassuring to see her smile become a little more genuine every day. Maybe I thought this was what I was meant to witness, to know that she would be okay. Then one day, two years after the accident, I saw her make a face that I had all but forgotten. And she came to retrieve me from her locker after another long day at work. She wore the kind of smile that she couldn't stop, even if she tried. Her eyes sparkled with hope and infatuation. I could see the blush on her cheeks. I thought seeing so much life in her again would make me happy, but then... I knew what this meant, and... And I didn't... I didn't know how to feel about it. Teddy, I think... I think I'm gonna be okay now. I think I can live again. She whispered with a giggle as she reached to scoop me up and hold me to her chest. I noticed that she wasn't wearing her wedding ring anymore, even though I saw it on her finger that morning, and it was... It was only one of several changes. That night I watched her sleep from her nightstand instead of in her arms. She wore that smile even in her sleep. She used to talk to me every day, but the next few days were wordless. She used to look at me as if I had never died, but... As if she could see me living beside her in those button eyes, but for those few days... I was made to feel like an ordinary teddy bear, no more alive than her cell phone I still sat upon. I'd be lying if I said it didn't hurt. <laughs> About a week later, I saw the man for myself. Dinner and a movie, light and casual, his name was Harold, and she spoke it with the same smile that she'd never stopped wearing, as though... As they took a seat at their table, and she moved to place her purse by her feet, he took notice of me. Who's this little guy? He asked with a honeyed, almost patronizing tone of voice. I was mortified. Oh, his name is Th Theo. She sounded ashamed as she handed me over to him. Had I become an embarrassment, an unhealthy habit? 
Was she sad that she couldn't let me go and move on? Her eyes glassed over with forlorn angst, and, and I, I felt farther from her than I had in years. He, on the other hand, clearly didn't notice. Well, he's adorable, Harold replied with a bit too much of a chuckle. Pleased to meet you, Theo. He took my little bear paw, pinched between his thumb and index finger. I'd never felt so humiliated in my life. I hated him. I would have punched him if I could. Angela quickly snatched me from his grip and held me to her chest. I'm sorry, she squeaked. He's... he's very special to me. Harold looked startled and regretful. I'm sorry, I, I didn't know. His tone turned stony and sympathetic. Where'd you get him? I'd rather not talk about it if it's okay. Of course, I don't mean to pry. He at least sounded magnanimous, but it didn't make me feel any better, no more than a few minutes after she placed me back into her purse did their conversation turn playful and jovial once again. But I couldn't hear a word of it. My ears were ringing, my head was spinning. I, I would have cried had I, had I had tear ducts with which to do so. A teddy bear. I, I was just a teddy bear. The next few weeks were lonely. Not long after their first kiss goodnight, she placed me on her nightstand, and it was there that I remained. No more rides in her purse, no more secret talks. Just long stretches of silence as I watched dawn turn to dusk and then dawn again. From the adjacent window across the room, sometimes I listened in on their romantic phone calls. Sometimes she slept facing me. And I... I, I longed to touch her just one more time. Sometimes she stared at me through the night, silent and frowning. Sometimes I fell on my side and lay awake without her touch. Sometimes I fell to the floor and spent the night hoping for sleep. Or for death. And sometimes, Sometimes she didn't come home, and I was left to contemplate the darkness alone, pondering memories of us, memories of her, of happiness, memories of sadness for the day I died and for that hospital room, and memories of him, the repulsive Jacob, wearing my ring like he owned it, like he owned her, memories that haunted me with every stirring shadow in the moonlight beyond her window. One afternoon, as if... To salt the wound of my misery, it was Harold who walked into Angela's bedroom and took me up from the nightstand. I could see her watching from the doorway, wearing something of a heartwarming smirk. He looked at me in the eyes, and he spoke with gravity and sincerity. Hello, Theo. He smiled. He wasn't speaking to Theo, the teddy bear. He was speaking to me. Angela told me everything. She told me who you were. She told me what you meant to her and what you mean to her now. I don't know if you can hear me, but... I know she spoke to you through this bear, and I can only hope my voice reaches you now. I, f I, I felt acknowledged for the first time since I died. I, I felt like a person again, like a, a man. It was a terrible thing that happened, he continued. You were taken so young, and she was suffering immeasurably for it. I'm sure you know you've been in her heart all this time. You were the reason she could walk again and live again, and I don't know everything. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of more stories to hear, but from the little I know, you were a great man. You deserve better than this. You deserve to grow old with her. He wasn't humoring her, or treating her like she was crazy. He was, he was being respectful. He spoke to me as if he were standing before my grave. I, I couldn't hate him anymore. I know I could never replace you, Theo, and I would never try. If any part of you is left in this world, if you can hear me now, then I hope you know that I'm friend. And I promise you, for the rest of her time in this world, I would care for her as you would. I love her now, 
not just for myself, but for you, and for what should have been. So, so rest in peace. Know that your memory will never die, as long as we live. It felt practiced, like he'd rehearsed his speech in his head many times before he said it out loud, but not in a bad way. It wasn't forced or awkward, it was sincere. He knew what this meant to her and what it would it would have meant for me. He shook my paw one more time, slowly this time. It felt genuine. With tears in her eyes, a smile on her face, she took me in her hands and looked at me in the eyes one last time. I'm okay, Theo. I can live again. Thank you for everything, wherever you are. My heart's with you. She kissed me on my little bare nose and placed me on the storage space above her closet where I would be safe. Right next to our wedding bands and a small jewelry box. I heard them make love in our bed for the first time that night. And I was surprisingly okay with it. I knew he would take care of her. My heart was at ease, and at last, I felt that I could pass on from this world. But I didn't. I was content to let those be my last moments on this earth, but they just weren't. No matter how long I waited or how hard I wished, I remained trapped, alone in the dark for days, weeks, months, years of loneliness, comforted only by sounds and sensations of the familiar and the alien, muffled conversations and laughter by day, sometimes strange shuffling and grunting in the night, the heat of summer, the cold of winter, and eventually the sweetest sound in the world. The cries of a newborn baby. It'd be several more maddening summers and winters listening from the dark before I saw the baby's face, and there... There are a few days I remember quite clearly. Uh, Angela was absolutely glowing, however tired and, and such a welcome sight after so long. She was smiling, and she took me down from the shelf, but not really, uh, not really at me. Those, those days, uh, those days had passed. Look what I got, Mia, she cooed in a sing songy voice to the chestnut-haired toddler waddling towards me with open arms. Mia had her mother's eyes. This is Mommy's special teddy bear. His name's Theo. Can you say Theo? Mia tried her best, but she wasn't good with the th, th sound just yet. It warmed my heart. Theo used to be Mommy's most special friend. Now he's yours, baby girl. Take good care of him. Mia smiled and hugged me tight. I spent that night in Mia's arms, under her unicorn bedspread, and it would have been the first of many. She didn't really understand the gift her mother had given her, and I, I wasn't terribly keen on the idea of being a child's toy. But Angela made sure that I remained an inside toy, as she put it, and the opportunity to watch this little girl grow up. Well, it was, it was well worth a bit of wear and tear. She was the daughter I never had. For, for, for years, I was there for every boo-boo, every nightmare. I heard every new word. With every new toy, I still held a special place. She, she even snuck me out in her backpack a few times during her first few years of school, and I was there to hear her learn and make new friends. And maybe I would often think there was more to see. Maybe I remained in this world for her. I wish I could believe that now, but this too could not last. Eventually, she started to grow up. In the age of makeup, gossip, and boys, so there's no room for a lonely teddy bear, so I found myself frequently buried under piles of dirty clothes, kicked under the bed. Eventually, in the confines of a long forgotten toy chest, so deep that no sound could reach me, and still I remained shackled to this bear. Even Angela didn't think to rescue me. 
Being too busy with the responsibilities of motherhood, I couldn't have imagined a worse torture as in a disembodied mind. But time had yet more to show me. It wouldn't be for more than a decade that I would see the light of day again. For a moment, through my hazy memory, I thought that the first face I saw was Angela's from the days before I died. Mia looked so much like her mother, but her gaze was impartial. She looked at me for less than three seconds before she tossed me aside into a basket of her other old toys and carried me out into the sunlight on the front lawn. I already knew what was happening when I saw the other tables full of odds and ends and it filled me with dread. I only got a brief glimpse of Angela as she walked past me. And I watched, and I wished that I could have turned my head to take a longer look. She wore a touch of silver these days. She had aged more gracefully than I could have imagined. Somewhere behind me there was a heavy-hearted talk of Mia going off to college. Talks of her baby girl becoming a woman, and Mia's reassurance that she would always be a baby girl. Talks of this... Imagery of memories, helping to shuttle Mia off to her future. Angie always did have a way with words, and it was those words which led me to believe that she never knew I was up for sale. Nor would she ever, as a stranger walked up to Mia and asked about me. How much for the teddy bear? My granddaughter would love it, he chimed. And for all the inseparable love in the world. Mia let me go for a measly ten dollars. I couldn't believe this was happening to me. Why? Why am I still here? Wasn't this whole ordeal some sort of spiritual revelation? What possible reason could there be for me to witness this? What loving God would allow me to feel so discarded? As I asked myself these questions, as I begged, whatever power kept me here to release me, a chill ran through me. Something terrible was coming. I could tell from his labored breathing during the otherwise uncomfortable silent car ride. From the way he clutched me in an angry fist as we descended down the stairs to his cramped, ground-level apartment. When he opened the door, it was a horror show. The walls were covered in familiar images. Some printed, some snapped in Polaroid, some crudely drawn but still recognizable, some old, some very recent, and she was... She was in all of them. My Angela. Remember me, little guy. I remember you. He mused with a voice like gravel and tar. He sat on the filthy couch and turned me to face him, and the dim daylight from the far window shone on the crest of his now craggy face. The years weren't kind to him. Age lines, stress lines, salt and pepper hair, rough and gray five o'clock shadow, and what looked like the onset of glaucoma on his crazed eyes, but still, of course, I remembered him. How could I forget? I remember how she held on to you the way she should have held me. He drew a pocket knife and flicked it open, the tip of the blade pointing between my eyes. The terror I felt was instant and hair raising. What was happening? Why are you making me see this? I remember how you comforted her. How I should have comforted her. I wish I could tell you that my senses contained in that stuffed toy only let me feel what I wanted to feel. I wish that I could tell you that I felt no pain when he hacked off my left arm and that it, it didn't blind me when he severed the stitch of my right eye. I wish that it wasn't just so I could feel her hugs and kisses. You're much the same, you and I, he continued. I could hardly hear him through my own racing thoughts and the piercing agony where my eyes should have been. We weren't good enough. We were thrown out like garbage. So I want you to be there. I want you to be there when I make it right. I didn't know what he meant. But I could guess. And that's all I could do as I lay on the couch, mangled and distraught as I watched him prepare for what was to come. As the sun set, I listened to him dictate his mad letter of obsession and resentment, one word at a time. He didn't expect to survive. The car ride back to the house felt much longer. I could smell the gasoline on his clothes and hear it sloshing around in the canisters he loaded into the back seat. I could see the pistol under his belt and the knife he used to mutilate me sat next to me in the passenger seat. 
the light of each passing street lamp glinting from the blade, I couldn't escape. I couldn't help, nor could I. I warn them I could only plead and pray, knowing with an increasing certainty that my prayers would go unheard and unanswered. Please, please, God, don't let me see this. Please, God, don't let him hurt my angel. I was only spared the sight of what he did as I tumbled from the pocket. He had stuffed me in while he feverishly crept into the master bedroom upstairs, but I was not spared the sounds of their screams nor the gunshots that silence them. Nor the heat and glow of the flames only moments later. From the foot of the stairs, my one dark solace was hearing the police gun him down as he stood on the lawn admiring his work. He didn't get a chance to end it himself. When all was said and done, the love of my life and her husband wheeled out in body bags. I could only be grateful that Mia was not home when it happened as much as it would scar her later. Regrettably, I survived with little more than a few singed fibers and a boot print courtesy of Jacob as he rushed for the front door. To this day, I've spent more time in this godforsaken teddy bear than I have in living flesh, and the past five years of that time has been spent in an evidence locker right next to the plastic bag containing the sick fuck's final words to the world. Five years reliving that horrible night, five years of tears I can't shed, five years of wishing for oblivion, and praying that my Angela rests in peace. Even now. As I wait my turn to plunge into the disposal incinerator, I wonder what manner of cosmic mischief has done to me this time. Or whether or not the destruction of this teddy bear will set me free. But I can't deny this inescapable truth. True magic exists. And it has no sympathy. It's as random, chaotic, and unforgiving as anything else. In this universe. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and happy holidays, Merry Christmas, etc., etc. And since it's the season of giving, the No Sleep authors, actually some of the coolest and the best No Sleep authors I've ever known, are working on the Monster Book of Monsters film project. It's in Kickstarter right now, but it's to give you guys a hundred story horror anthology that's also in the efforts of creating a television series based on popular internet horror stories. If you guys have been displeased with some of the other creepypasta media, like say the Slenderman movie or Channel Zero, well, here's your chance to actually support something that will give you creepypasta stories, no sleep stories, and horror stories made into a, a television series from the people that wrote them. And their Kickstarter is gonna be running the entire month long. Help them out if you can, guys. I'm going to put the link in the description down below. Also in that description down below, there's going to be a little button you can click that says subscribe. And there's going to be a little bell you can hit. So, how about the Monster Book of Monsters film project from the amazing authors at No Sleep. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more horror stories. Thank you so much, guys. And once again, happy holidays.